this is my life now. I, I, ref- I refer to it as being pension-pilled, because once you start seeing pension funds, you see them everywhere, and you can't unsee them. Hello, and welcome to The Depot Podcast. My name is Amanda Witt, and I'm here today with Tom Frazier to discuss his academic and journalistic work surrounding Canadian pension funds. We are both affiliated with the Deindustrialization and the Politics of Our Time initiative, which has its home here at Concordia University. To the best of your ability. <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, my name is Tom Fraser. I use he, him pronouns. I am a second year master's student at Concordia University uh, and a student affiliate with the Deindustrialization and the Politics of Our Time project. My research is on Ontario's public sector pension funds and their investments in real estate since the 1980s. Uh, do you want to talk to me a little bit about the process of how you got to doing these projects? Was this more based on people you were working with or more based on some passions you had uh, before starting? Or a little of both? Yeah, so it's definitely a little of both. Uh, in terms of the pensions in particular, I can trace the origins back to a research trip I went on in, I guess it would have been the fall of 2019. So it would have been shortly before the pandemic, the last trip I had before the pandemic, where uh, I went with a professor to Hudson Yards, which is a massive real estate development on the west side of Manhattan, and was startled to discover that it is 50% owned by the Ontario Municipal em- Employees Retirement System, which is a Ontario-based pension fund. So that kind of put the pension real estate thing in my brain uh, as just something that was kind of slightly on my radar. And then flash forward about a year from there, and I was beginning to figure out what I was going to do for a course project. This remind this came uh, came to my head, and doing a little bit more snooping into the Ontario Municipal Employees Retirement System, or OMERS as I'll call it going forward, I discovered that OMERS also owns, through public private partnerships, a bunch of public schools about an hour from my house in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And so, you know, it was truly staggering to me that the largest real estate development in the history of the United States and a bunch of public school infrastructure in rural Nova Scotia could be owned by not just the same investor, but owned by a public sector pension fund. And that sort of started me going down this rabbit hole. But there was a broader kind of academic political interest I had in, uh, in the project that kind of stemmed from earlier academic work where my major interest always in my academic research, or at least for a very long time, has been in the interrelationship between labor and housing and how the trade union movement is able to mobilize its connections to community struggles in order to fight for, you know, safe, sustainable, affordable housing. And so it was very striking to me that one of the ways in which labor unions are most connected to housing is through their pension funds and through investments in residential real estate, which at the same time as unions are hypothetically part of, you know, this struggle for affordable housing, their investment funds are actually doing the opposite work, but outside of their control. Uh, it's There's a very complex sort of legal architecture that ensures that there's very little democratic control goes into uh, pension fund investments. So that interest in labor and housing collided with this information I had found out about, you know, Canadian pension funds in particular as real estate investors to basically start me down a pretty, a pretty enormous rabbit hole to try and untangle, you know, how is it that labor unions can disentangle themselves from this pension system so as to be able to earnestly and compellingly participate in struggles for fair housing. Interesting. And so for uh, myself as um, an American and anybody listening who may not understand how Canadian pension funds might be unique 
uh, if you want to take a little bit of time and explain just what the pension fund system is in Canada for employees and for unions um, and anything you found about how they might be unique compared to other places. Yeah. So I guess just to sort of start from start from basics. So a pension fund pools the retirement contributions of employees and employers who have collectively bargained for a pension. Uh, and so in the case of Canada, that these days is predominantly in the public sector because unionization rates are predominantly in the public sector. So whereas in the US, union density and public sector work because of right to work laws, things like that is you know hovering around 15, 18%. Uh, unionization in the Canadian public sector is 80%. And the bulk of the Canadian labor movement is concentrated in the public sector. And by extension, the bulk of Canadian pension coverage is concentrated in the public sector. So these funds pool the retirement savings of all these workers and then invest them in capital markets, whether it be in equity, in bonds, or in the case of these funds that I'm looking at, in things like real estate and infrastructure. So part of what makes Canadian public sector pension funds unique on a global scale is not just their their relative might in terms of their investment quantity. Uh, so the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan has an asset value of over $200 billion. OMERS has an asset value of over $100 billion. But what makes them unique beyond just their scale is actually their specific approach to investment. So in uh, 2012, The Economist wrote a special article on uh, on Canadian pension funds referring to them as maple revolutionaries because of the particular approach they take with regards to real estate and infrastructure. So whereas US-based funds are still very much focused on the equity game or focused on uh, both public and private capital markets, Canadian uh, pension funds have taken a real particular interest in the potential long-term returns that come from participation in public-private partnerships, uh, which are a sort of neoliberal form of infrastructure development. And in terms of the long-term returns that can come from rent from real estate, whether it be commercial or residential. So that also makes uh, Canadian pension funds fairly unique. A couple years ago, uh, the World Bank actually published a report calling it the Canadian model uh, and encouraging pension funds across the world to take into consideration how Canadian pension funds operate in terms of their approach to investment, because they do focus more on alternatives than other um, than funds from other countries do. Okay, and if do you have you seen any news of anybody uh, adopting that model or taking like any major steps to adopt that model? To your knowledge, um, not to my knowledge, but if I'm being totally frank, it hasn't really been something I've been actively searching for. Uh, my focus for right now really is in-house, so to speak, and just looking at yeah. the internal operations of uh, the Ontario funds. If I if I go about this work further, then it will probably include looking into how much of an influence the Canadian funds have been internationally beyond just economist articles and World Bank reports. Because uh, this is some, the, the pension world is one in which um, Investors from different countries are, are definitely talking to each other. Policymakers are definitely talking to each other. So the whole restructuring of pension systems worldwide really began in the 1970s with, uh, with reforms made in Augusto Pinochet's Chile that basically mass privatized the state pension system. And that was basically the firing gun for a widespread upheaval of pension systems worldwide, really, really hardcore pushed by the World Bank to encourage countries to either privatize and basically turn state pension systems into universal 401ks or to marketize and turn state pension systems into investment vehicles. Uh, and that really became this sort of global, global push. And it was in that context that these Canadian funds actually restructured into market actors in the 80s and 90s. And so it wouldn't surprise me one bit if we saw in the next couple of years and if we've already seen, and maybe it's just not something I've become aware of, uh, pension funds, especially in the United States, uh, focusing more on uh, real estate and infrastructure. I yeah, I, I don't know either. That's not something that I've uh, studied. But I, you know, I feel like real estate in the U.S. is like very individualized in the way that it is seen as 
seen as an investment, right? Unless you get up to like a certain echelon of like very wealthy people, in which case then, yes, it is collective again, uh, which is funny. It seems not funny, but it seems to be a little bit of an inverse. Um, and then I saw, cause I read both the Jacobin article, article and the Canadian dimension um, article where you spoke about this. And uh, that was what was really interesting is immediately when we started talking, you connected the housing to uh, these pension funds, because I was like looking at the two articles you had written for Jacobin. And I was like, wait, what? Another uh, thing that you had mentioned was that there was a shift from investing in infrastructure projects to um, investing in these um, real estate and these other programs. But what has um, happened to that infrastructure investment? Like what is made up for that deficit? Has anything? Um... Oh, sorry. Uh, it's been a shift towards infrastructure. Towards infrastructure. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's been a shift away or away from just entirely equity. Uh, so both private and public, but in, uh, less and less public towards more investments in things like infrastructure and real estate. Okay. So in, in, no, it's, it's totally okay. Uh, so in the, in the language that these investors use, they refer to uh, alternatives as like different forms of investment outside the conventional stocks and bonds and infrastructure mm -hmm. and real estate are the two most attractive alternatives. And in the context of the post-financial crisis, post-2008, Alternatives are increasingly attractive as, you know, something that's potentially less volatile than, uh, than stock markets can be. And so the Canadian funds especially have really pivoted towards them as a way to avoid the pitfalls that occurred in 2008 when stock markets uh, cratered and pension funds took a pretty major hit. You know, it's this perverse irony where the 2008 financial crisis was by and large a real estate induced crisis. And the solution to it in the eyes of the pension funds is to truly double down on real estate. Oh, that's so wild. Um, what was the, so I experienced the financial crisis in the U.S. Um, as a 30 something. Um, I'm wondering how, was it, was it as severe in Canada? How was that? So there's a, there's a common conception that Canada weathered the financial crisis in a way that other kind of significant global north economic powers didn't. Um, there was no official bank bailout in Canada, so to speak. But actually, research that I've come across as part of my work has kind of kiboshed that notion just a little bit. So there's research by uh, the geographer Alan Wax at the University of Toronto, who most of his work is on financialization, real estate, and mortgages, has suggested that Canada bailed out its banks but did it basically around the back door by using the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, which for an American context is Canada's mortgage insurer, uh, state mortgage insurer. So it's analogous to something like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Um, I forget which one is which. And basically through the mass insuring of mortgages, Canada was basically able to reinflate the real estate market in the aftermath of 2008. And to bring this back to the pension fund, so pensions take a pretty big hit in the stock collapses in 2008, uh, bigger in the United States, but also in uh, but also in Canada. But you then have in the aftermath a pivot towards uh, towards real estate as you know this hedge against volatility, which includes in a in a truly perverse sense for the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, actually buying Canada's largest private mortgage insurer which used to be called uh, AIG Canada. It then went under in the 2008 financial crisis. And the Ontario teachers bought it for pennies on the dollar in 2010 and turned it into Canada Guarantee. It's the only fully Canadian-owned private mortgage insurer in Canada, and it's fully owned by uh, the teacher's pension. And so at the same time as you know, housing is this vital component of people's retirement, you mentioned this uh, earlier in this individualized kind of asset-based welfare structure, you also have the pension funds not just getting involved on the direct real estate ownership side of things, but you also have them involved in all of the financial steps of that asset-based welfare system in the case of the Ontario Teachers Own and Canada Guarantee. And actually, just a couple just a couple weeks ago, this is something I'm still trying to parse through the meaning of and the consequences of, uh, the Ontario Teachers actually bought... Uh, a reverse mortgage company. 
which, you know, that's one of the ways in which people in desperate financial straits finance their retirements is through reverse mortgaging their homes. And a retirement fund is actually going to be one of the beneficiaries of that. There are a lot of these sorts of kind of micro ironies in the uh, in the pension fund world. Absolutely. And um, I, you know, I will speak from my perspective is that the only time I've known or seen of folks doing a reverse mortgage are when they're in dire financial straits. Often um, in my country, it's because of medical costs. So it's either a way to maintain housing or a way to uh, mitigate medical costs. So it's very like, you know, a little painful. (laughs) Has there been much uh, pushback from the teachers unions or are they just like this, like all funding is good funding? Like, how's that? response been if there has been any yeah so i haven't seen any to the reverse mortgage in particular but to kind of the wider spirit of the question there's a a a complicated a complicated relationship between plan beneficiaries and their investments because on the one hand you know there is a very earnest and you know i i don't intend in my research to to demean this in any way you know, a deserving of a good pension on the part of a teacher, on the part of a public sector worker, on the part of a nurse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These people have earned a stable retirement and they did not build this system in which their stable retirement was predicated upon exploitation. But there is a complicated relationship that arises because of this, uh, we'll call it a Faustian bargain between rate of return and uh you know, potential social corrosion uh, that does kind of catalyze resistances at particular moments and particular junctures. So, you know, to refer back to my Canadian Dimension piece on CPP investments, investment in IGWA, uh, the Rio de Janeiro water utility, that came onto my radar because the Canadian Union of Public Employees actually released a statement condemning it. And the Canadian Union of Public Employees has actually done quite a bit of work in particular with regards to uh, the ownership of privatized infrastructure by Canadian pension funds as part of the union's wider opposition to P3s. Or to use another example, uh, at present, there's a campaign being led by the Public Service Alliance of Canada to have the Public Service Pension Investment Board uh, withdraw from its ownership of Rivera, which is a long-term care facility chain which has been, you know, the site of quite a bit of, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but quite a bit of death during COVID. Uh, there's been a campaign within PSAC to uh, to nationalize that company, despite the fact that its rate of return is beneficial to them. But, you know, there is generally this wider ambivalence. And so in the 1980s, when these funds were restructured, so f- to, to put it into context, up until the 1980s, uh, the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, which at that point was called the Teachers Superannuation Fund, was entirely invested in government bonds. It didn't do any investments in capital markets. It didn't do any investments in infrastructure. It didn't do any investments in real estate. And there was this push from, and a consensus across parties, across unions, across teachers themselves, but also across people in the financial community, uh, investors that the teacher's pension should be pivoted towards capital markets in part because it would offer a higher rate of return for the financial community. There is also, you know, dollar signs in their eyes at all of this investment capital. And for the teachers, you know, there was the notion that they weren't getting the rate of return they could conceivably be getting by being invested in government bonds. Whereas in capital markets, they could be getting a higher rate of return, getting better benefits. And that's, you know, it's an understandable it's a totally understandable uh, position for them to uh, for them to have taken. It did, you know, make them strange bedfellows in a certain sense with uh, with financiers and investment bankers. But you know, sometimes weird alliances emerge. One, but one, you know, particularly interesting part of this, and this is where we get back into you know campaigns to you know, sort of fix some of these investments is that part of the teacher's impetus and labor more broadly's impetus towards market investments rather than government bonds during that period of restructuring in the 1980s was the notion that it was actually through market investments rather than government bonds 
that unions could actually, you know, have some sort of democratic control over investment structure. And so they thought that if they were able to get, you know, a wider restructuring of the pension system away from government and towards towards the market, then they could actually directly exercise some sort of control and avoid socially corrosive investments. At this time period, the context is South Africa. So they're trying to encourage divestment of their pensions from uh, from apartheid South Africa. There's a campaign in that period led by nurses to withdraw the healthcare workers of Ontario plan from diamond mines. Uh, and that provides a really pivotal context to these kind of pushes for democratic control in the context of marketization. Unfortunately for uh, for labor, and I would go by extension to say, unfortunately for all of us, uh, there was not success in those pushes. And what ended up emerging are these structures called joint trusteeship, where unions and employer representatives, who are generally kind of financiers, have 50-50 control over boards, but then delegate investment decision making to you know, hired investors, you know, from, you know, commerce programs, from finance programs, et cetera, et cetera. So there is something resembling democratic control. I won't go so far as to call it democratic control over the plan itself, but investment decision-making is insulated from anything resembling democratic control. And so the main levers that can be pulled to push for that come outside of the pension fund altogether from labor campaigns for divestment. And so you get that in the case of South Africa in the 1980s, you get that in terms of what PSAC has been doing with regards to Rivera. They had a successful campaign also with regards to private prisons a year ago. Uh, and you're getting it also with QP's response to, uh, to IGWA. It, it very much is kind of public exposure more than working within the system appears to be how something resembling democratic control can be actually... Um, can be actually kind of wielded. But it's it's complicated because there's a very intricate legal architecture that has been designed to ensure that rate of return is placed by and large above everything else. So in the Pension Benefits Act, which was kind of the, the crown jewel of this restructuring in the 1980s, Ontario enshrined what's called the prudent person rule, which is that basically that a pension fund investor, their one and only obligation is to maximize rate of return to the best of their abilities based on, you know, this weighing between risk and reward. And so, in fact, if, you know, a union were to take control of their pension fund and use it for social, use it for social ends, they would in fact be breaking the law. Like there's a very careful scaffolding to ensure that only investment rates are the number one consideration when it comes to investment policies and any social objectives take on to say secondary importance is to even overstate that tertiary importance whatever the fourth equivalent is the fifth the sixth and in looking at all of this are you do you see a way at all that this system like can or should be salvaged or how are you kind of is that even something that you are like thinking about as you are doing this work i think about it constantly I'm never not thinking about it. And, you know, the easy thing to say, and it's unfortunate because it's so easy and yet is not actually sufficient, is to say, okay, well, if these employer-based schemes are making these investments, then what we need is an expansion of a public retirement scheme. That on the surface sounds fantastic. The issue with that is that the Canadian pension plan, which is the public pension, is also a major financial investor. So it was restructured in the 1990s to go from being an entirely contribution-based scheme, what's called a pay-as-you-go scheme, to being fully funded based on investments. And so in that case, you know, to refer back to the Canadian dimension piece, that's the state pension plan. That's not an employee-based pension plan. That's a state pension plan. And so to just expand the public pension would mean having to have a higher rate of return, would mean a higher rate of exploitation. And, you know, we'd be right in the same in the same problem that we're currently in. So a couple things would need to happen. And one is on the financing of retirement side, a.k.a. the pension. And the other is on the provision of retirement side, a.k.a. the commodities necessary for everyday life. On the financing side, 
what we need is a pivot back towards systems of pension contributions based on investing in government bonds so that we can have an expansive welfare state that's internally financed, uh, increase corporate taxation as a funding structure for a pension system, and increased employer contributions so that we're not putting the burden on individual workers, but instead putting it on uh, large employers to keep the Canadian pension plan funded and take it out of capital markets so it's no longer predicated upon exploitation. So that's part of it. But the other part of it, and this is where I'm particularly interested, is that what we need to be thinking about is a world in which a large pension actually isn't necessary because then as commodities required for everyday life and old age are, you know, best case scenario, no longer commodities or, you know, affordable. And so what we need actually is an expansive system of rent gear to income housing you know, because residential costs are one of the highest costs for people in their old age, regardless of whether they own or rent. Uh, good food systems, uh, pharmaceutical coverage, you know, how much of an elderly person's income is spent on pharmaceutical care. And, uh, you know, networks of actually publicly operated, publicly owned uh, long-term care facilities. So, what I actually envision as the solution to this problem is a situation in which a large pension is actually totally unnecessary, except for as kind of a supplementary thing. Because what we should be thinking about is a world in which retirement is decommodified altogether. So at present, retirement is about as commodified as you can possibly get, both in terms of it being investment finance, but also in terms of it being a terrain of profit. We've seen that in the case of the pandemic, where privatized long-term care facilities have uh, been such an epicenter of a nationwide trauma. And so we need to be thinking in terms of both the pension fund side, but also the provision of retirement side into how do we remove the market from this equation? And ultimately, it comes down to a decommodification of everyday life. And that's where my research kind of comes fully back around. And I actually, my, my thesis project concludes with a conceptualization of what a just retirement could conceivably look like. That's amazing. I think you really, I love how many like aspects you draw in there. Um, it's, yes, I... <sighs> Sorry, I'm I'm just thinking about the very different retirements of my two grandparents who made it to retirement age and how strongly dictated that was by their financial situation. And it really is something that, you know, we think about retirement as this boogeyman and then this like uh, narrative tool for making people more protective or more supportive of the system in which they're investing. But you know, we don't think about how like unjust it is that we have to make those choices to begin with, you know, I guess my other question is, um, what do you see, you know, let's say after you're done with your master's and you have written, do you think that you're going to continue with this? Do you have any other things on your horizon that you're like, oh my gosh, I wish I had more time to read or research about this? This is my life now. I, I, ref I refer to it as being pension pilled because once you start seeing pension funds, you see them everywhere and you can't unsee them. You know, you can't, you can't roll that clock back. And so now that I've seen them, this is what I have to do now. This is the, this is the cross I bear. So it was funny when I first started this project, just as like a piece of coursework, you know, I mentioned the idea of it to a friend of mine. And she was like, Tom, you're going to spend the rest of your life as a pension fund historian. And I was like, ha ha, no, I'm not. And now here I am. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. My, my hope is that I can take this research in a more applied direction because there are really direct public policy implications for all of this. Uh, and the stakes are, and this is something that we've definitely seen during the pandemic, the stakes are extremely, extremely high. And so it's just something I, I hope to kind of wed this research to kind of other other work that I want to do in terms of uh, really potentially enacting some sort of significant change in Canada's pension system. Amazing. So we're about at 30 minutes. And I think that this would be a good time for me to ask if there are anything that you want to talk about that I have not asked you about yet. 
Um, nothing particularly comes to mind. I mean, like, you know, I can talk about this for hours, but I think we've covered a pretty, a pretty stellar range. Yeah, no, I think it's been amazing. I've, I've learned so much, uh, just right now, um, about this, about this system and program. And, um, I'm glad you're stuck, uh, researching this forever because you're really good at talking about it. So cheers. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Depot podcast. Please remember to like and subscribe so that we can get a little more attention to this feed. It really helps and does make a huge difference. Also, if you want to pitch an episode or have any follow-up questions or references involving the episode, please get in touch um, through deindustrialization.org or through our Twitter, deindustrialpoll. So just the word deindustrial with the letters P-O-L at the end. Thanks so much for listening and have a wonderful day.